and um, these compounds they are very have a very low polarity. That means um, they always try to find a way to um, to hide away from the beer, from the liquid. And by this uh, very bad polarity, um, normally um, you don't find them in a very reasonable concentration um, in late hop beers. But you find them in can find them in high concentrations as well in dry hop beers, depending on the amount of hops that you add to the beer. And you'd have to know that Milcine, for example, is a group with the highest um, um, concentration, highest volume um, in percentage in um, in the hop oil. Then we have the sesquiterpenes. We all know cariophyllin, eumolin, and farnesine. They are also volatile, but not that high volatile than the monoterpenes. Um, to find, let me say, a reasonable concentration uh, is hard to achieve in uh, late hop additions. You find them more in dry hop beers because um, yeah, they have a very high threshold and to come over the threshold that needs also very high hop dosage. So the relevance is not that much, but coming to the next guy, so monoterpene oxides presented by linalol, geraniol, citronellol, and terpenol. These are not that volatile and they have a very high significance um, in um, late hop additions and also in dry hopping. And um, especially when you have a very high hop load in um, at the, before knockout or in the whirlpool as well, you will be able to transfer a lot of them into the hot word. And what stays there in the hot word um, normally more or less remains later on in the beer um, after uh, the final production process in the container. So um, they are very important and they're also very important for the so-called biotransformation that comes with the next slide. Um, now, please, please go back. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm not completely done with this slide. Um, the other guys, the aldehydes, ketones um, in gray, um, they don't have this dominant, um, not the do dominant group in, in hop oils and not uh, in beer, but they have a little fruity and flowery like note. And what comes next? These are the thiols, the sulfuric compounds. Um, we know this 4 MMP that appear. Uh, that we have in a um, cascade with a, let me say, a black current-like character. And on the other side, the 3 MMP, especially concentrated in Nelson Savon variety from New Zealand, that has a white wine-like character. And a lot of other guys come with um, sulfur in the composition of the molecules. And by this sulfuric um, molecule construction, the threshold is very low. It's much lower than for the other component groups. There we are talking about micrograms per liter, and here we now talk about nanogram per liters. And that means that a very small addition uh, coming into the beer have a very high impact on, um, on the smell and on the taste of the beer. But it's hard to detect them. And it's, um, for us, it's, uh, yeah, it's still um, very interesting to develop uh, good analytics to find them in, in, the, in the cones. And, have a look on them regarding the whole process until it ends up in the in the bottle or in the can. So there's something to do still, and uh, it's under development. But I think, but the, they are more important in in dry hop beers because uh, they are also very volatile and evaporated uh, in the whirlpool when you have a late hop addition there in the brew house. And the carboxylic acid esters are very important as well because they are not that volatile compared to the monoterpene oxides. Uh, have a similar behavior, especially um, a lot of them you will find later on if they come from, li from late hop edition or from a dry hop edition, that doesn't matter. So these guys, uh, the esters and together with the monoterpene oxides, they appear as well in late hop and in dry hop editions. And so they give a, have a very high um, um, profile um, they can give to the to the aroma profile of a beer. So now, Darren, you can switch. So we we all heard about this um, so-called biotransformation that hop-based terpene alcohols um, have the ability to change the molecule structure, and everything is starting with the free. Generally, generally, in in um, in the liquid in the beer in the world, or 
with uh, geraniol released from a, a precursor form. The precursor form can be um, a sugar molecule that is linked to geraniol and also can be an acetic acid rest that's also linked to geraniol. In this form, the geraniol has no aromatic impact until an enzyme that is released by the yeast when fermentation starts. And this enzyme, um, this beta-glucosidase, is able to split off this precursor from um, the sugar molecule, for example, from the geraniol and um, set geraniol free into the liquid. And that can uh, later on move into citronellol, linalol, and terpenol. That is what we call biotransformation. Um, that depends uh, on one side, on the variety that you are using. Um, there are, let me say, geraniol um, donators coming from Bravo, Lotus, and from the, our variety Sultana, for example. They have a very high geraniol poten potential, and they also have a very high geraniol precursor potential. And um, you can imagine that the freshness of the yeast and also the enzymatic activity of the yeast has also very high impact on this biotransformation. So if you have um, a hop addition, um, if it comes from a late hop addition in the brew house or it comes from dry hopping, it has the ability to go in contact with this enzyme released by the yeast in fermentation, then you have a good chance to use this biotransformation and that has a positive impact on the whole appearance of the aroma impression of your beer. If you do it very late, if you do a hop addition very late, when the yeast is, let me say, settled down or has done its job, the uh, enzymatic potential is not there anymore, or when it's very, on very cold temperatures as well, then you see that the biotransformation does not behave very well. And that has a big, very big influence. You can test it in your brewery. Um, it has a very big influence on the appearance of the, of the aroma. And we always found out that the beer was dry hopped in a, let me say, an earlier stage when fermentation was at the end or maturation was beginning. It was much better, has a much better um, aroma profile than a beer that was dry hopped afterwards when the yeast was removed. So please now go to, to the next slide. Okay, now we come to, um, to our, let me say, our ranges of um, hop oils that we have on the market. And in general, we divide in between two lines. One line is to create or to mimic a late hopping like character in the beer. That means um, you can, by adding hop oils, you can create the same profile as you have when you add a lot of um, hop material, a lot of pellets into the whirlpool or five minutes before knockout. And that is what you can do very late before the last step of filtration. So these hop oils, we call them type Noble, Noble Plus, um, are created for very late processing in the brewery. And that's the right point of addition. This is the, before the last step of your filtration, if you do filtration. You can also add it if you have no filtration. That's also no problem. But here you can see that everything is, um, let me say, um, up-concentrated. The linalol is up-concentrated for Noble to 10% or to 20% for our Noble Plus. And by this, we also were able to remove or to reduce the concentration of, um, of mono and sesquiterpenes as well, like myrcene, eumelin, and carifelin. The concentrations that you can see here on this slide are very low compared to what you can find in nature from, um, from a hop oil coming directly from the cone. And that's the trick on this um, compounds that they are more or less concentrated on these terpene alcohols and also on some esters, which do not appear here on this list, but there's also a high uh, concentrated um, amount of esters together with um, linalol as a leading compound in this product. Next slide. And on the other hand, we have the so-called dry um, hop oils. And dry means we have one that is uh, uh, the cheaper form. It's a generic one that comes from, from different um, varieties um, with a certain concentration of mono sesquiterpenes and a little bit of linalool. And then we have, and that is um, one of the main groups, uh, what we said that is, um, or these are the variety specific hop oils. And we produce them 
Um, meanwhile, with steam distillation in uh, the US, from US varieties, we do the same in the Hallertau, from Hallertau, or from European varieties, also with steam distillation. And another one that we have, another product that is a synfilm distilled hop oil that is produced in the US from extract. So they're also able to take out the oil from an extract. So that means that the whole range of available hops we are able to um, distill um, and to bring out the oil and to sell these oils as 100% variety specific um, in a certain um, dilution, we normally prefer the 1 to 100 in PG. Um, our colleagues in the US, they prefer to sell the concentrated form. And that is also something that you have to know if you want to have hop oil, in which concentrations I get it, and how can I dilute it later on in my brewery. And that will the colleagues um, later on will talk about. So next slide, please. So these are the, um, the well-known dosage points for our hop products. Um, the green cone means that is a point of addition where we can use pellets, for example. We also have added this hop back here that could be an option that normally comes um, from the from the UK guys. They use it since uh, since centuries to bring hop flavor into the cask uh, ales. And here, when we start with the first drop, that is the first addition point for hop oils, and that could be. Um, in between fermentation and maturation. Um, normally, it doesn't make sense to start with hop oils in, in, the, in, the hot, um, in the hot block of the brewery or directly in fermentation because it's causing a lot of losses. Um, but here is the right point where we can also use the enzymatical power of the yeast that I mentioned before, um, uh, especially regarding biotransformation activities. Next point could be somewhere infiltration, could be before the Kisugo filter, it could be behind Kisugo filter, but at least it should be um, when the beer is filtered, it should be before the last step of filtration. Because otherwise, when you do it later on, on the way to the bright pit tank or from the bright pit tank to the filling line, um, in a filtered, in a clear beer, it might occur some uh, haze in the beer, and that is something that you don't want to have. So next slide, please. That is how it can look. That's a very simple drawing. That is uh, for the for an automatization process um, of hop dosage. That's something for the for the for the bigger guys who have this automatization in house. Um, simple to um, explain you have a flow through a beer pipe. And then um, you measure the flow, give it this um, um, signal to a control unit and the control unit is um, moving the membrane pump up and down depending on the flow and then the op oil comes in by an injector and then you have a let me say a face could be um, 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 a nozzle where you um, have a turbulent flow of the beer and by this you have a good um, homogenization of the product next slide please So that's also something for the for the bigger guys there on the right side, just the dosage unit as an example from 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 a company there in the Hallertau who's responsible for dosage systems worldwide for pellets and for downstream products. Here you see that is um, a small vessel with an agitator, and also with a with the pump and the flow meter that works together as one unit, and this can be um, adapted to a beer pipe, and for for dosage of hop oils, also for other downstream products, and um, but this normally has no no impact for you guys because you are uh, craft guys and you want something that's more handleable um, and practicable for your small breweries. So please go further. So if you have um, without filtration, you can also do it um, the addition prior to the BBT. And if you have filtration, you need to make it before the last step. Um, or filtration, maybe before the last trap filter system. Next slide, please. So we, were, we once made some trials. We produced beer. Um, we presented at the Brau in Nuremberg. That's the reason for these more than 700 tasters that we had. And um, we produced um, beer, one beer with uh, P90 Bravo and the other one with hop oil variety Bravo. 
and we had the same point of addition that was um, into the maturation tank. And the result was that these um, aroma profiles, the spider web uh, coming from both beers were very similar and was nearly matching. We were surprised about this. So the effect coming from the hop oil was like the same effect um, coming from the P90s. And now the next slide you can see, um, we did the same when we added the hop oil to the same beer. Um, just right before the last step of filtration. So there was no addition to maturation. And then we also tasted the beer and we came to a completely different result. So that profile that we once get from Bravo um, in maturation um, from, from the hop oil was not the same as we got from an addition right before the last step of filtration. The beer was completely different and the aroma impression was also completely different. So the addition point has also um, very high impact. Next slide, please. That's just one example about what we have um, outside the brewing world. And beyond brewing, people try more and more with hop oils because they're easy to use and easy to handle. And that's one example. That is a hop store. That's a hop lemonade that's available in Germany. It's alcohol-free, has a good drinkability, and has a very good hoppy note. Uh, next slide. Um, you also some examples that I found in the World Wide Net about the utilization of hop oils in different categories of beverages and drinks, starting with water, going to um, lemonades, and also found some ciders uh, that were spiked with a hop oil addition. Okay, next slide. So I want to give it back now to Mike. Yeah, thank you, Frank. All right, Kevin, take it away. Well, it was a pretty good transition from uh, the non-alcoholic side into uh, what we do here at Athletic Brewing. So kind of quick company background. Uh, Athletic was founded back in 2017 in Stratford, Connecticut. It was the nation's first 100% non-alcoholic brewery. So you can get all the hop and malt character of traditional craft beer, but with none of the booze. Um, and so then they expanded production back in the spring of 2020 out of San Diego, where I'm currently located, um, to Ballast Point's old sour facility. So this is our main production facility out here. And then uh, being the fact that we are non-alcoholic, we do have food safety. So we're also governed by the FDA as well as the TTB. So kind of straddling food and beer. So food safety and quality are definitely at the heart of everything that we do to make sure they're putting out a safe product. So the, uh, the biggest product that we have that utilizes the hop oil is gonna be our day pack seltzer. So it's gonna be hop infused non-alcoholic seltzers. Uh, we have four flavors. We have the lemon lime, mango, black cherry, and blood orange. Um, I'd say that they're fruit forward. So the, the first aroma you're going to get is definitely going to be the fruit. Then it finishes off with that uh, kind of the depth that the hop oil brings. So we use the Chinook hop oil uh, and then organic natural flavors to achieve these, these tastes. And uh, the Chinook oil was selected for the kind of piney resinous citrus note that pairs well with a, a wide range of fruits. So um, the reason why we went with the hop oil is just the ease of use compared to using pellets. Uh, we had done a variety of kind of hop seltzer experiments involving pellet hops and it just wasn't consistent. You don't have to worry about vegetal matter. Uh, it's just a lot more sanitary and cleaner as opposed to using plant material. Uh, the consistency at scale. So we're, we're doing these in 100 barrel batches and then just trying to get it done back tank after tank with T90, which is gonna be too big of an issue and also the dosing rate. Uh, a little bit of this hop oil goes a very long way. So started off doing three barrel trial batches in Connecticut. And like I said, then we ultimately scaled up to our large production facility out here in California. So the, uh, the dosing method and production. So yeah, so we don't have a fancy uh, injection system as of yet. So essentially the goal is to inject the hop oils using uh, PG and ethanol. And we're also testing another carrier uh, currently just to try to make it as natural as possible, but mixing them up in the corny and then shaking it and agitating it to get the emulsion itself mixed up. Then you can see in the top picture here, we have an inline loop build up, pulling from the bottom of the tank through a pump uh, where we then inject the hop oil mixture and then the static mixer, which is on the bottom portion of the screen right there. Uh, essentially using a centrifugal pump moving it through at high speeds, you're able to get a high amount of agitation, which actually allows the hop oil to dissolve properly into the uh, 
the deaerated water. Um, so that's kind of our dosing method, but our big, biggest concern here is the fact of food safety. So we have to make sure that our water is treated, our water is clean and deaerated, and that the pH of the final product is going to be below 4.6. Otherwise, you have pathogenic concerns. And then, uh, so the high carb and no sugar also act as stabilizing effects there. So from this process, we would usually take our RO treated water, deaerate it, and then inject around 60 degrees, which allows us to then get the emulsification. So, and then, yeah, so we have, we're still working on trying to figure out the optimal temperature to dissolve in. Like I said, this is a brand new product, uh, lots of R&D currently going on, but definitely fun and exciting. Okay, thank you, Kevin. All right, we'll turn it over to Randy. Take it away. Uh, hi, yeah, thanks for having me today. So, um, my name is Randy Cockrell. I work for Old Hickory Brewery. We're in Hickory, North Carolina. Um, we were established in 1994. Um, we are in multiple styles of beer. I think I would imagine most of you listening in have probably heard of Old Hickory Brewery through one of our barrel aged beers, Event Horizon. Omega Point, beers like that, but we do have a core brand of um, year-round beers with standard styles, IPAs, pale ales, stouts, and the like. Annual production is around 2,600 barrels with distribution across North Carolina and edging into surrounding states. All right, next slide. So we first started thinking about using hop oils back when we were getting into 12-ounce uh, bottles, which we used to package in only bombers. And so one of the first reasons we thought about it was to increase our yield. We were losing money on every 12 pack of our flagship IPA at the time, Death by Hops, because we were losing so much volume to hops and then also the value of the hops that we were adding to every single beer. And so we are typically as a brewery, not our ethos is not Ryan Heiskabolt, we're not purists in that sense, but we do tend to shy away from using things that aren't readily recognizable as food is probably what the brewmaster would say as ingredients in our beer. But I think at the time I was able to convince him that hop oils are just a different version of hops. And so if, you know, if we use DME and starters, then we can use hop oils in our beer and it's a similar idea. And so we started thinking about it from that increased yield. But what we found once we started using it was that not only did we increase our yield, but we were able to reduce our dry hopping by about half. We also found that our hop flavor and aromas were being maintained longer in package and on draft. Um, consistency from batch to batch was very, very good. Um, and then faster turnaround. So we were finding that sometimes with the amount of dry hops we added, it would take a week or more of dry hop of a hop contact time to get the profile we were, we were ready, we were wanting. Whereas now between dry hopping and hop oil additions, we can achieve the same effect in, you know, three to four days. Uh, thank you. So as far as hop oil selection, I mean, this is based entirely on our brands, but what I can say is that we do tend to focus at Old Hickory on uh, using uh, the hop oils in our IPAs. And so we're focusing more on getting the fruity um, and tropical fruit notes from hops. And that's because that seems to be what our brands were more missing, even with the addition of massive amounts of, of dry hops, we were still missing, I think, the, the impact of those flavors. So we use a lot of Sultana, Cascade, Lemon Drop, Calypso, and Eureka. Um, we've dabbled with Nugget and Apollo before um, as well. Uh, what, what I will say, and I'm sort of getting on ahead of myself with talking about flavor trials, but what I, what I do remember from, the, from that time was that the panelists more enjoyed beers that had a mix of hop oils versus just one uh, variety per brand. I'm gonna go to the next one. So as far as the dosing rate, we started, um, so Hopsteiner has a, a spec sheet on all of their different hop oil preparations and the hop oils that we use, we started um, with the dosing rates that were suggested on the sheet and we raised them until the panelists like it. Um, we found that a pretty moderate uh, dosing rate achieved the effect we were looking for because keep in mind we are combining this with still dry hops you know we haven't stopped dry hopping and then when additions got too high the panelists thought it was perfumey in an artificial way that wasn't pleasant so that's how we dialed in our um, use of that when we we're first using the oils we used some commercial you know light-bodied American lager 
uh, to sort of get an idea for what the hot boils individually were like. And then we did final dosing uh, experiments and flavor panels with the actual brand that would receive the hot boil. As far as dosing rate, um, to determine that on a small scale, um, like I was describing with the commercial beer, and then finally the um, Old Hickory brand, uh, we started by making a one to 10 dilution of the hop oil in 95 uh, grain alcohol, 95% grain alcohol. Um, the brewmaster liked the idea of using ethanol versus propylene glycol, um, but it, it works just fine. And then of that one to 10 dilution, um, depending on the uh, rate in grams per hectoliter that you want, you're able to add, and I've, I've got some, some numbers up here, but the point being the, the one to 10 dilution, or you can even do a larger dilution, is sufficiently dilute to be able to dose a, a one liter of beer um, using a volume that's reasonably accurate to measure. Um, and those volumes are all measured with uh, micro pipettes. Um, so that's the technology of choice for, thank you, um, for fluid transfer in the lab. So when it comes to scaling up, then we, it, since we had used that grams per hectoliter um, rate sort of equivalency in, in our one liter trials, it was a simple matter of multiplication to figure out the amounts for our, our uh, batches at scale. Um, I used the density of the oil um, as a way to convert mills to the grams that are needed, or the grams that are needed to mills of the oil solution. Um, for a 20 barrel batch, which is a standard batch of IPA that we brew, I'm able to measure the hop oil of each. So usually we add about four to five different hop oils per beer. And so um, measuring those with a P5000, so that's a five milliliter pipette with uh, the disposable micro pipette tips, I found was very accurate. Other people, you know, use serological type pipettes, you know, of, you know, one to five mils capacity with great success. But I found personally for me, I like the accuracy and the precision of the, um, of the, of the pipette tip. So, and, oh, we can go back real quick. Um, this is something that Mike asked me a lot about, about how do I mix it? Do I mix it for a long time? I don't, I, I, I mix hop oil tinctures day of, um, I always use 500 mils of ethanol. So typically I achieve about a one to 100 dilution, but um, when we have brewed 40 barrel batches, I have not increased that um, ethanol to one liter to get it, to get, to maintain the one to 100, you know, grain alcohol is expensive. And we were just going to see if we could achieve similar results. And, you know, the solution is somewhat stable um, at that, but since it stays in the bottle for such a brief period of time, um, it's and before it's introduced into the beer, I haven't noticed any issues with that. Okay, so then when it's time to add it to the beer, um, this sort of goes counter to what Frank was talking about at the top. We actually add our hop oil um, suspension to, or solution to our beer as it's leaving the centrifuge. So we add it to the bright beer um, going to the tank. We add it all at once. And then we use basically the turbulent flow of the rest of the transfer to make sure it's well mixed in the receiving tank or which is typically a bright tank. So we have an inch and a half TC that we fill with the solution. Uh, you can usually fill it to the top um, the first time, then you shoot it into the stream of beer using CO2, think like a hot cannon. Uh, you fill uh, the remainder of the solution. You may not get all the way to the top again. Um, so th then you would just purge that remaining headspace with CO2 before shooting that in. Then you um, allow beer to fill the sight glass um, and then you shoot that solution back into the line of beer that's going out of the centrifuge twice to rinse any remaining oil residues that might be on the sight glass. Um, and then I'll pass it along. Oh, oh, okay. Someone's asking, how do I purge? So, I mean, honestly, you have, um, if you can see at the top there, that's a CO2 quick connect on a, on a inch and a half um, cap TC that's been sort of uh, there. So what you do is you actually will, you can either take off the clamp altogether and you just sort of burp that space um, with CO2 or, you know, I've seen the operator actually just be able to loosen that um, clamp and then be able to get enough um, unsealed of that cap to get enough to, to get gas to pass. And he waits for anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds before we call it purged. And since CO2 is heavier than air, it's sufficient. We haven't seen giant increases in our dissolved oxygen, which we do measure after transfer. Our dissolved oxygen rates are still excellent. 
Okay, thank you, Randy. And uh, I know we have a lot of questions yeah. coming in, but we'll uh, get to those here uh, mm -hmm. after Nick finishes up. Go ahead, Nick. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, Randy. Um, so I'll just give you a quick bit of background about Cara Brewery and um, uh, some of the products and the reasons why uh, we chose Hopstein or Hop Oils for um, the beverage production. Uh, so uh, Cara Brewery is, uh, is an old brewery. It's 1960 established. Um, we, it's a production brewery for the region. There's also plants in Trinidad, Tobago, Granada and Florida. Produced uh, 12 different products there. We've got uh, five lagers, three stouts. Then the licensees for Guinness, Mackeson, Skull and Stag. Um, and the, if you flip, go on to the next slide, Darren, that'd be great. The, um, the size of the brew house that we're dealing with is a hundred hectolitre. So there's your UK and US barrels. 70% uh, of the island's GDP is generated uh, via tourism. And this is mainly in cruise ships. Um, the island is also home to one of the largest um, veterinary training universities in the world as well. So most of the students there are from USA origin. The concept for and the challenge I was given was to develop an IPA from an existing um, core product range without having to go to the extent of generating an entire new beer. Um, given the fact that um, uh, coronavirus, um, lack of trade and the evaporation of 70% of the entire market, we needed to come up with a mechanism of being able to do this in very small scale. Um, so we chose one of the cool range out of the five lagers, we chose one of the cool range uh, lagers and there's the uh, specifications on that. Um, so just like uh, I think Randy said that he had used American uh, lagers to test, we were running essentially an American lager for the carrying to create this IPA. Um, the market that we were targeting were USA based students. So uh, we had a lot of comments that they were looking for a um, non lager based product. And um, we thought if we could come up with a, with a, a way of generating this, it would uh, be a good way forward. This product is draft only. When we're running a full bottling scale at that size plant, we're looking at about 40,000 275 mil bottles. Um, so the draft only was a, a good way about being able to test the product within the market without having to go to the extent of um, new bottle branding. We could just uh, run uh, pump clips, um, so uh, tap handles to um, be able to sell um, this new, new version of the product. Should it prove more popular, then, uh, then we can then roll it out through other production sites. So we contacted Hopsteiner, which are our original suppliers for all of our hop products. And we use CO2 um, hop extracts mainly. So it reduces all the losses of uh, vegetal matter within the production um, line. The hop oil combinations were chosen by uh, the four lead um, century guys. So that was the head brewer, head marketer, um, the draft beer manager and myself. We selected the products based on their aromatic profiles. Um, the lead sensory team um, came up with a mechanism, just like the other guys that said, uh, we needed uh, hop uh, complexity. Just running one single hop did not give enough uh, of the aromatic uh, characters that we were looking for. Like I said, um, we were running this as a draft only because the bottling on this scale was not, not an option. So I'll just um, have a look at those uh, um, aroma evaluations. And this is purely why these two were, sh were chosen. Um, um, the hops were then rated on the aromatic um, compounds and we really were trying to emulate a session IPA. So the uh, characteristics of that um, we were looking for, if you go on to the next slide, um, citrus driven primarily, 
um, fruit notes. We wanted some resin, some her uh, herbal type character. And after sampling the uh, and and conducting the aromatic trials on the eight samples we were sent, we decided on the sultana and the lemon drop um, varietals. So we looked at the dosing rates that were recommended by Hopsteiner. Um, so at half a gram to three grams per hectolitre, uh, that's five to 30 parts per million. And this is a pure, this is the pure hop density. So it's, that was the neat sample undiluted. Um, to test this on the scale that we were looking at, we went as, as a one in 100 uh, PG dilution. It made the product a lot easier to handle. It was pre-diluted. It allowed us to make sure the mixing was a lot easier as well. And given the scale and how powerful hop oils are, and you've heard from Randy and Kevin, and they've all you know, given a testimony about how powerful these are, um, when you're using them, you need some pretty precise control to make sure that you do not overdose um, these particular products. We tested them at a base um, profile of 50 grams per hectolitre on the one in 100 dilution. And it was the dosage that we decided that did not um, become um, uh, artificial. It gave, it gave a very natural um, uh, type of flavor, aroma or perceived flavor, and then the aromatics that we were looking for. So the equipment that we were using, um, we were using a one mil pipette with pie pump, uh, 0 0.1 mil increments and one litre conical flasks for our tasting trials. Uh, you can go to the next slide. The um, combinations were made up using the dual different types as well. So we're looking at uh, 50, the 50 grams per hectolitre, which is the 0.25 mil and 0.25 mil of lemon drop sultana combination. And so I'll run you through the, how we made these dilutions up just for the tasting itself on the next slide. So we added 150 mils of our base uh, lager beer, um, put in our um, hop samples, swirl to emulsify. And you can see there, um, just as was suggested, we did see some um, clarity changes to the beer itself, it wasn't substantial. It wasn't substantial enough to become a worry. And um, we've run with that, uh, that, that um, mechanism of dosing in those quantities as well. We topped it up to the 1000 liter um, milliliter marks so or one liter mark, and then uh, we divided it out for the, um, the sampling. Go to the next slide. Um, as I said, the lead sensory team came up uh, with the dosing mechanism. And then we then invited a series of students to come in on um, a couple of different occasions. We would also then um, make sure that we'd include doubles as far, as far as our tasting and sampling goes, just to eliminate any outliers that may have uh, come through. And then we tested our top four products to verify the tasting results against each other. And we come up with some really, really solid, um, almost unanimous um, uh, tasting results across those groups. Um, we are dealing with uh, non-trained uh, sensory um, uh, analysis on this one. So we tried to make it as simple as possible with them then coming up with a, a sample from one through to four. Um, we came up yeah, with the same results every single time. Um, there was a clear standout from the hot, hot oils that we had chosen and they had become a, a consistent favorite. Can go to the next slide. So the market testing, we've actually only just gone out um, on Thursday, Friday of last week to run these out to market. Um, the total the dosing rates that we were doing, I've just seen someone who's just asked on the chat about what, uh, what the calculations and dosages were. We used um, four mil of each varietal as a one in 100 dilution um, into the keg. So we um, added the hop oils into a pre-purged keg. And we re-purged and then filled it up from the uh, black beer post down. 
We had an excellent market response, 75% liking the beer, 15% of the customers making this their first product choice, um, 38% seriously consider a net, next purchase, 40 might consider, seven would not consider. Um, the seven that wouldn't consider would generally outside the demographic of what we would have expected a IPA drinker to be in the first instance. So there was no real surprise. Um, uh, the sensory feedback that we got from the market testing in the bars and pubs that it was rolled out to was, was really good. And we got exactly those um, uh, notes, flavors, and tastes that we were expecting, the session IPA, tropical mangoes, lychee sort of type notes. Now, due to the fact that we haven't had a market to sell this to, in the quantities that we need to, given the scale and size of the brewery, because of the, uh, the lack of tourists coming to the island. Large scale has yet to be undertaken, but um, we were going to per, um, add this directly into uh, the 100 hectolitre tanks, bright post filtration, um, and we were going to then use the undiluted, and then you can see the uh, quantities we're going to use there. So that was going to be 30 mil of each varietal, 60 mils. And like I said, it is an exceptionally powerful product. We've also used um, these products in uh, car scale production in the UK. And we've added those in directly into the uni tanks, FEs, and these are uh, 4,000 litre tanks um, at capping gravity. So three points above where terminal uh, gravity is prior to crash chilling, and then we've left it for convection current to um, mix. And we've had very good results with that as well. Um, the advantages of why we chose this was uh, we could do it for both small and large scale application. Um, Hopsteiner could tailor and would make the dilutions that we require. So we could either specify one in 10, one in 50, or one in 100, depending on what the, um, the scale that we needed. And it's very small and very transportable. We could get this from Hopstina FedEx into the Caribbean in a matter of a couple of days. And thanks very much to Mike for sorting out and facilitating all of that transport as well. Getting goods inwards and outwards of the Caribbean, especially during the, at, at this time is problematic. So um, having something that's so small and so transportable was really, really good. Um, so we could create a, an entire new core line without having to uh, delve into the depths of a complete new branding um, and scale trials. Thank you. Okay, Frank. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, thank you all. So I want to give now a little bit of an overview about uh, the benefits that we have seen uh, that we have by the utilization of hop oils. And um, we have seen that we are able to create um, a late hopping like character and also dry hopping like character in beer by the uh, different uh, uh, hop products that we have on the market. And yes, we have no annual variations. And that's something negative because we have up and downs, especially in Europe with the hop oil concentration in hops and also linalool concentrations and everything is adjusted when you sell pure hop oil. We have no plant or foreign material. You see there on the right uh, picture that is clear oil-like uh, 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 product, no green uh, particles inside. It's light stable. You can use it also for light stable beers or other, other products, other beverages in uh, flint glass bottles. We have no influence coming from bitterness because there are no bitter compounds inside, no alphas, no isoalphas, and we have no nitrate impact. And so you don't have to have an eye on the nitrate concentration, total nitrate concentration in the beer because nothing comes from the oil. You will have no beer losses in dry hopping. That is something to, to save money. And we have no hop creep impact because there are no carbohydrates, no um, mono or, or multiple saccharides coming in. We have no enzymatic activity there in the hop oils, and you have no secondary fermentation, no formation of additional CO2 or alcohol by using hop oils. Okay. So, 
right? Yes. Anything else? Yes, last slide and coming to the summary of our small workshop uh, today. Um, we have seen that we have a lot of options um, regarding different kinds of beverages when we use hop oils. It's not uh, everything linked to beers. We can also go to ciders. We can go to seltzers as well. We can also think about non-alcoholic beers who give a certain aroma profile to cover a little bit the, um, yes, the um, aroma of a non-alcoholic beer that comes from stop fermentation or from dealcoholization. That's also an option. And we are, have a great flexibility also when we create new products um, because we only need a small amount of hop oils that we can um, dilute and then add to beer. And then we can make a tasting as this was presented by our colleagues, um, by Nick, um, and a very short notice with a um, lot of different options regarding several concentrations or several different op oils um, in the beer. And um, yes, we have the option to reduce beer losses. We can also make a partial replacement of dry hopping, um, as Randy um, said. Um, we have to know that the calculation must be around um, the calculation with total oil addition. So we have a little bit better and higher utilization of the hop oils compared to the hop oils that we add with, um, with pellets. And so if we make a replacement, we can calculate with only 70% of the hop oil um, compared to the pellet addition um, when we make a replacement. And we still have the aroma and we still have some um, impact from pellets in combination um, with the hop oil addition. Um, it's easy to use. We have seen um, it, everything depends on the dilution. You need a good way to dilute. You need a good way to bring it into, into the beer stream. And if we have a small brewer, you can make it with a very small device, um, as we have seen from our colleagues. And if you're a big, boy, you can, a big brewer, you can also use some um, bigger automatized technical um, equipment. We have no um, nitrates impact. We have um, consistency from batch to batch. There's no impact from crop here. So we can say um, that we are able to, um, to bring in multiple products into the world of beverage production. Whatever you think about, hard seltzers are coming up more and more. And also there's a niche to um, to add some hop oils to hard seltzer to make lemonade alcohol free products and so on and so on so it's a very wide range where we can um, use our hop oils and every variety normally we can we can um, provide to our customers also on demand on very short notice so that's all from my side and i give it back to mike now okay thank you frank uh yeah so we've got uh, quite a few questions here and um Let's uh, go ahead and start off. Uh, Kevin, uh, there's a question about what temperature are you processing um, the uh, hop oil into the uh, seltzer? Yeah, I can add to that one. So currently uh, we're doing it around 60 degrees. So we are taking our hot lick and deaerating it just to ensure that it was bacterial free, free of contaminants, pulled down to 60 and then injected and did the static mixing from that point. Okay, thank you. Um, Frank, there's a question, uh, what's the shelf life of hop oils? Second. Frank, you there? Uh, yes, that's, that's a good question. The shelf life, um, we don't like to extend shelf life to, to, to years and years and years because it's a fresh product and you have to use it as a fresh product. And um, we are able to, um, to produce and to um, provide you with fresh hop oils on demand. And okay, our, what we give in, in Germany, that is one year, but we normally sell it in a dilution one to 100. And um, the Noble Noble Plus has a shelf life of two years because that we don't have this um, big amount of mono and sesquiterpenes and especially the monoterpenes, they tend to, uh, let me say, kind of um, agglomerization and, and um, add losses by this. So, but the shelf life is, is limited um, by, yeah, by the natural structure of the hop oils. Okay, uh, there's another question about, do you always need to dilute with ethanol? Now, I think uh, we've had 
several people comment using PG, but Frank, are there any other options that you're aware of? So what, what I think and what we found out is um, that we do, and that is what we, what we do with our um, type dry here in Germany, because we are allowed to use ethanol. We have always a pre-dilution with um, ethanol in, uh, in, 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 in 5 percent ethanol. And then we do the, the main dilution in PG. And that has the, um, the advantage that the first dilution is made in ethanol and that's in ethanol. And that's a very good solvent for, for hop oils. It uh, has a little bit better solubility in um, ethanol than in, in propylene glycol. OK. Uh, Kevin, a question for you. The, uh, do you pasteurize a seltzer? And if you do, is there any impact to the hop aroma flavor uh, between uh, before and after? pasteurization? So we do actually do not pasteurize the seltzer. So that's going to be the, our food safety plan dictates given the pH carbonation and the lack of sugar that it's completely shelf stable to go without. Okay. Uh, question to the group here. Can you use hop oils to, to make a hop tea for dry hopping during active fermentation? Anyone have any experience trying that? I don't know if anyone's done for a hazy IPA, tried adding hop oil uh, during fermentation. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. If adding undiluted oils directly to the FV towards the end of fermentation, does that provide sufficient mixing? And then why mess with injection and flow control and all the rest? I guess, Nick, you probably have the most experience of adding it uh, in the FV or a unitank. Yeah, look, um, we just went simply for ease um, and the lack of um, equipment to be able to do inline injection. I've used, um, I've used just putting it directly into the top of an FV for cast production with really good results um, without the, the difficulty of, of uh, inline injection. So I don't, if, if the results are working for you, I would say um, just run with it. Uh, if you are having uh, difficulty getting uh, missable products, we're, we're also dealing with um, a one in 100 dilution so far. So it's not as, uh, it's not, you know, we've already got a partial dilution on this product. So I, I felt that's probably a little bit easier. Um, because we haven't gone to or haven't had the ability to be able to do a non-diluted product, uh, I suspect that may need a bit of a, um, a change in thinking about how we do inject it into a tank. But definitely with the uh, diluted product, I haven't had any issues putting that directly into an FE. Okay. Uh, Randy, question for you. Uh, what is the, your substitution rate for using oil versus type 90? and a dry hop application? Yeah, I saw that question pop up. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I was involved in, excuse me, I was involved in optimizing the overall amount of the hop oils. So uh, Stephen Lyerly, our brewmaster, was responsible for dialing back on the pellet additions as dry hops. I would, say though that I've always encouraged him to be very um, methodical about that. So typically what what I would imagine um, happened was after we started adding oils at, a, at an amount we liked, he maybe pulled back five to 10% per batch until it was just before he didn't like it. And then we stopped. So it's very much a trial and error process. You know, we're not a brewery. I can't, you know, I, I don't have a GC mass spec. I can't quantify um, hop flavor and aroma compounds as they disperse into beer. And so it's very much um, a trial and error. So even if I could give you a rate, the rate for our brands could be entirely different than the substitution rates for your brand. So I think, you know, unfortunately, I think that it's something that you'll have to troubleshoot in house. Yeah, that's typically what most people do trial and error. Uh, you just really don't know each process is a little bit different. The extraction rate of the hop oils out of the pellets is going to be different. And uh, so it's really a trial and error process. 
Uh, Frank, I got a question here about are you uh, able to provide the calculation to convert density to mills for hop oil? Um, the density is um, 0.8, so that, that one milliliter has a weight of 0.8 gram. So it's not one by one. PG has one, but if you have a dilution in one to 100, so this um, 0.8 density doesn't matter anymore from the hop oil portion. And then you can calculate with one by one. Then you can okay. use milliliter in a diluted form as gram. Okay. Uh, Darren, there's a question uh, regarding the presentation. Will that be available? It will, yes. Um, a link with the recording will be made available by visiting our customer portal page on our website. And uh, yeah, if more questions or comments pop up, feel free to email us directly using the uh, email address below. Okay. Um, just so uh, we can, let's go ahead and move on to the acknowledgements. Yeah, just uh, want to recognize uh, several uh, organizations and people here. Uh, special thanks to John Walker uh, from Athletic Brewing Company, Stephen Lyerly at uh, the Brewmaster at Old Hickory, and then the team at Kara Brewery that Nick worked with, um, Mark, Kevin, Andre, and Benjamin. And then finally, I uh, want to personally thank the Hopsteiner production team for all their support and um, uh, producing a, a steady, consistent uh, product for our customers. And um, look forward to um, getting more feedback from everyone. And uh, Darren, I'll let you go ahead and uh, wrap it up. Uh, yeah, big thanks again to our panelists, Kevin, Randy, Nick, Mike, and Frank. Um, yeah, again, the recording will be made available by visiting our customer portal page. Uh, once again, my name is Darren. Thanks for joining us and take care. Cheers. Thank you.